have as a, as a friend of the show and, and friend of mine for over 15 years. Um, he's come intermittently to the show whenever he's been able to make it. He's obviously been, been uh, gotten busier and busier over the years as his projects have uh, been successful literally across the world. And it's been so, uh, so fun to watch his journey. And, uh, and we've been thrilled to have him as a, as a part of the show. And uh, so well, I'll just give you a little bit about last year. He's brought his underlying mission of connecting people to nature and into homes for the past 35 years and shared his adventures with audiences around the world and inspiring millions to get outside. And along the way, he's created, as most of you know, an entirely new billion dollar genre is called survival TV. And as a multi-award winning film producer, author, and musician, he brings messages of creative innovation, resiliency in the middle of challenges, advice on facing the gatekeepers, and methods on unlocking your own success instinct, all underscored by a deep well of passion for the natural world. And there's no one who we know uh, loves the outdoors better. And so without further ado, I want to introduce Mr. Les Stroud. Thank you. That's Paul standing room only right there. Oh, I have to take a picture of this. Hang on. Everybody ready? Yeah. Yes, it's that era, isn't it? Yes, it is. Okay, biggest selfie I've ever done. <laughs> and video. <laughs> yeah! That's insane. Actually, now that I think of it, so uh, I think one of the things we can do, I'm going to do this, you know what, really, we're just going to have some fun today. This is, I'm, I realize there's no point in me doing it, like a talk and walking. Let's just make the whole darn 45 minutes we got here together a Q&A, start right from the beginning, right to the end. Um, and in doing that, I thought, okay, well, here's one easy way of doing it. Uh, if you got your cell phones, which I see some of you do, what if I said no cell phones? <laughs> you know, then. If you got your cell phones, and if you're in Instagram, go to Instagram, follow me, go to Real Left Stroud, follow me, and then put a question in your Instagram and start it with, I'm here. And I will, as we're talking today, I'm going to look, I'll go to the host, and if I see a, 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 I'm here and a question, then I can answer your question that way rather than someone yelling from the background. So we'll do that. Uh, as I said, I didn't really come here with like some big presentation plan because I just wanted to chat and talk with you guys, but I do have a little bit of, we call it housekeeping. This is, uh, this is all braggadocia at the moment, but for those of you who have kids in that sort of, uh, hey Rob, who have kids in that sort of uh, five to 14 year range. Uh, Anna Cress and I did a book that I see right down there. Recently, uh, it's called Wild Outside, Around the World with Survivor Man. And uh, it's already won two national awards for Best Children's Nonfiction. It's up for a third national award. And we have a bunch of them over at the Survivor Man VR booth. So I'm really, really proud of this. I put a lot of time and effort into it. And I just, Anna Cress was fantastic with me. But I'm very proud of this book. So for your kids, grandkids, nieces, nephews, there's one sales item out of the way. Let's see, what's number two? How many people, show of hands, I, I should ask, is anybody familiar with the series Survivor Man? <laughs> How about Wild Harvest? Yeah. yeah. Oh, and all the rest of you, you're missing out. <laughs> you get a little FOMO going here, because Wild Harvest, uh, Wild Harvest has now got two seasons on air, 26 episodes, and it's the easiest show, if you've seen it, you know this, it's the easiest show that I ever shot. Uh, it takes me two days to make an episode. It's so cool. The first day, I take you out and we walk through local foraging. Everything from dandelions and fireweed to pine needles to wild asparagus, whatever we find, in the mountains or in behind Walmart. And then I give that food to Chef Paul Rogowski from Rouge Restaurant in Calgary and he makes an amazing meal out of it. And by the way, for those of you who are filming, please feel free. Share, post, share, put it up. I got no rules on any of that stuff, so go for it. Um, so Wild Harvest is on, you can see all of the episodes on my YouTube channel, uh, just Survivor Man Lester Out, and uh, it's also airing in Canada with Blue Ant Media on Cottage Life TV. They've always been really good to me over the years, they took the Survivor Man episodes and put them on as well. Um, but Wild Harvest, Lester Out's Wild Harvest is also airing around the world. Number three item, which is the main reason why I'm here, is Survivor Man VR The Descent. Actually, that's not the main reason. The main reason is because Fred and I are buds, and I haven't been here. How many were here with me like 15 years ago, right from the beginning? Yeah? Well, I'm just going to say the same damn thing I said back then. But okay. Uh, so, um, 
I actually am really thrilled to be back here. When I'm here, I'm going to tangent away from that for a second. When I'm here at this Outdoor Adventure Show, please understand something. I'm not up here as a TV celebrity or a survival guru guy or even that guy. I'm a canoe head. That's it. I go, that's what I go back to, guiding for the Tomogamy Wilderness Center and Black Feather Wilderness Adventures and Canadian Wilderness Trips and sea kayaking and canoeing and hiking where Algonquin Park and Killarney and all of that right up to the Nahani. That, this is, as I would say, as I said to someone this morning, these are my peeps. This is it. This is home for me. This is, and see, if I go to Ottawa or Pembroke area, go to the Canadian Canoe Museum, same thing. It's like, yeah, I'm home. So please see me that way today. I'm just one of you guys here who just freaking loves being out in nature. That's where it all started. Now I'm a ham and I'm a showman and I'm a filmmaker and a musician and a creator. That's how the rest of it came along. But Survivor Man VR, that came to me from my old buddy, uh, Dave Brady at Cream Productions, who's there for, with, in, with me in the beginning for Survivor Man. He said, hey, we got this whole thing going on with VR, you know, Survivor Man, we're per perfect for it. Long story short, here we are now launching the Survivor Man VR. Yes, it's a high tech, yes, it's Oculus Quest. Uh, it's the whole headset uh, VR reality experience. But it's pretty darn cool because what I did, my job in all of that, the people who put it together were like Andrew over Cream, they're brilliant. My job, hold their feet to the fire. And just like, no, no, that wouldn't happen. I had to do some slight compromises here and there because it is VR, but for the most part, you know, it's like, oh, well, we're going to do this and then you can catch a rabbit. So you never catch a rabbit like that. So don't put it in the game. So I treated the VR game like a simulation, like as if you were doing helicopter, you were, if you were training in helicopter flying, you do simulators. That's the way we treated this. And that's the way I said, it's the only way I'm going to get involved. So it was really fun working with them to get the Survivor Man VR out. It's out now. And I'm going to be right after this, I'm going to the booth. I'll meet you back there. Um, oh, and that children's book, by the way, is available at the booth. And so what's last? And the last piece of maintenance I want to get out the door here is just that um, many of you also know that from way back, I mean, from when I was 14 years old is when I first started writing songs. I've been writing music and performing music, doing my own theme songs since, and doing stuff like that since I was 14 years old. So musically, this year's a big year for me. I've got three new albums coming out, concerts happening, I'm playing up at Nature's Harmony Eco Lodge up in, up in Manawa. Um, in just a short while, and so I play in the Neat, the Neat Cafe in Burnstown, Ontario, not very far from here, coming up, uh, that's in August. So I'm back out performing and doing my music, and the cool part of this, I was talking to Fred earlier, is that even with the music that I do, yeah, of course I write the odd love song and the odd this song and that song, but mostly I'm always writing about nature, connecting to nature, and just being inspired by nature. And so a lot of the songs, I mean, the, the, the single off the new album is called, is called Take a Hike. You get the picture. <laughs> So, there you go. That's my braggadocio uh, uh, maintenance, if you will, housekeeping done. And now let's just hang out and chat and I'll tell some stories. Let's start right off the bat, just real up close. Who's got a Am I going to play the Algonquin Theater? If they lower their rent charges, I might. <laughs> Uh, if I can, I will, yes, because I do love playing. It's a wonderful place to play. I'm going to try and play all throughout Southern Ontario. There's, a, uh, there's one coming up. Um, oh, I forget. But if you follow me, follow me on the uh, new bands in town. i got a lot of catching up to do with my musical stuff and get it, get it all rolling again. You know, hanging on the way it is now with all the social media and all that sort of stuff. And I'm going to get that all rolling, but you will be able to see where I'm playing all around Southern Ontario for sure. Any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, in regards to Wild Harvest. So, how did your collaboration with Chef Paul come to come? Uh, to so, the question is, how did this for uh, Lester Al's Wild Harvest? Uh, and again, first going back to that show, if you, people will say all the time with the Wild Harvest series, that show is just like, I, I watch it before going to bed at night, it puts me to sleep. Understand, that's a huge compliment. I've gotten that, I used to get that for Survivor Man too. Oh, your voice is so soothing, it's just, I fall asleep. I'm like, great. People are falling asleep watching my stuff. That's awesome. I don't mind that at all. I consider that a compliment. And Wild Harvest, is, it's like a meditative experience. What I do is, uh, for, as I said, I take you out, and, um, and one of my favorite parts of it, we go to the mountains, we go to the swamps, but I actually, the last episode is coming out next Friday on YouTube. We filmed in, uh, in, literally in behind a Lowe's department store in Calgary, Alberta. Just like in behind, like, trucks everywhere and everything to show, and we found wild mustard and, and wild radish and horse, horse radish, I should say. 
So it's really, it's, like it's soothing. I get you out there and then I show you identification and then uh, I give it to Chef Paul Rogalski. Now Chef Paul and I, we, were, we actually met down in Mexico. We were, we were on a, an ill-fated pilot for a cooking series. And I was doing it as a favor to a friend to go down and be like a celebrity tasting kind of guy. Paul and I met down there. And then we just said, you know, we should do a show together. Yeah, we should. Six years later, we stopped for a beer in Calgary and Ron Harvest is now on. So it was really pretty much as simple as that. It's a wonderful series if you haven't seen it. Um, and it's amazing what you can do with dandelion. So, <laughs> so stunning and so beautiful. Um, and that has always been a big part. But like you've seen it with the Survivor Man episodes. You know how there's always that moment where I stop and go, look, I know this is really rough, but look, look what I'm looking at. You know, it's still powerfully beautiful. And even if you're struggling, you're still in amongst incredible beauty. Let me tangent for a second on that. Slice of personal philosophy here. Again, as I said, I come from this world, and, and why all of you are here. This, this is absolutely the world that I was entrenched in. But there was always a difference with me, even as a canoe guy. I was never the weekend warrior way of doing it. So I would have guys come up to do a trip with me. I'm the guy, right? I'm like, okay, we want to hit 30 kilometers every single day. And I would always go, oh, okay, here we go. <laughs> All right. And you know, you're in the canoe and you're bam, and you're like, mm, getting the muscles going and portaging and sweating. I'm like, how about we do like 10 kilometers a day and swim for the afternoon? <laughs> That was, that was me. So even with Survivor Man, it was important to me to point out this connection to nature, even within the scope of having to struggle and survive. And I'll tell you what survival has never been. It's never been versus anything. You don't verse yourself against nature to survive. You work with nature to survive. Every survival instructor in here knows you don't fight nature. You don't fight the weather, you don't fight the mountain, you don't fight the rapids, you don't fight the trees. You have to work with nature uh, in a beautiful sense to actually survive. That, that was always the underlying philosophy of what I did with Survivor Man, and I'm sure you, most of you saw that come through on the show. Okay. Yes, sir. <coughs> what, what is that interesting? Oh, an and interesting food. Well, first of all, it wasn't that that familiarized with uh, chaga, believe it or not. So chaga was one that uh, said, okay, this is pretty cool. And you know, you want to be really careful when it comes to the local foraging and the wild gathering. I went to a birch forest recently and I could tell, because I'd been there previous, all the chaga was gone. So someone's gone through and they probably took it home and they probably cramped, uh, put it all up and then they put it in little bottles and then they put a nice label on it and then they bring it to the health food store and they go, you know, earthy chaga here for you. And it's like, yeah, and you just wiped out all of the chaga in that region. So that was another thing that I, that, that I loved being able to teach in, in Wild Harvest was respect for the natural environment. Uh, Fiona Chambers out on the West Coast, who's on two of the episodes, this was always a big thing that you, you may not know this, but with our wild edible plants, we can encourage them. We can help them to thrive. There are some certain plants, like Spring Beauty, for example, if you don't harvest it, it actually starts to recede and wither away. Why? Because it requires disturbance to spread its seeds and for its bulbs to get bigger. And when, you, when it's left alone and it's not actually interacting with something that harvests it, be it animal or be it us, then it, it, can, it can die, it can fade away from that area. So harvesting can happen, but doing it ethically and responsibly in the right way. I love doing it with the, um, oh, fronds, uh, you know, the fronds in the spring. Fiddleheads, thank you. Like with the fiddleheads, and in that episode, we were in the Pitt River in the West Coast, and you know, one of the things that I've learned a lot about plants, and I, and I love the whole, the hidden life of trees, the, you know, the German writer, you know that book, okay, that whole series of books. And recognize and realizing that the true heart, brain, life, and body, if you will, of the creature that we would know as this particular plant is mostly under the ground. And what's above the ground is feeding what's under the ground. And learning that for real was a bit of a revelation to me in harvesting. So in harvesting fiddleheads, for example, I can take the, the, the nine fiddleheads off that plant, and I'm killing that plant because those, those fronds were going to feed it. But if I take one, or maybe two at the most, it will still survive and thrive and do well. So learning that about plants has been really important to me. This is the thing, even with Survivor Man, Survivor Man Bigfoot, Beyond Survival, and Wild Harvest Now, 
And even surviving disasters, if you see that one. For me, I was always there as a student. I was there to learn. So, so I'm, I'm going to be careful where I tangent here when I reference other endeavors into that world. The point of going ahead of time to South America and train with someone who lived locally in a remote jungle area, that was my whole point. And that's why now on the YouTube channel, I'm now finally releasing the original Survivor Man training footage when I would go down and learn from these people because it was fascinating to me. I was never able to put it on the show because in the end, the network's like, well, we don't want all that training stuff. And so you never saw it. Now you're seeing it. And I'm like 20 years younger. <laughs> we thin hair, better abs. But in any event, that training was really important to me because that's been the beautiful part of all of this. I mean, you guys know, if, if you're tr learning from anybody, any outdoor skill whatsoever, and they're giving you the definitive, this is it, that's all you have to learn, you need to learn from someone else because we never, that's a beautiful thing about the outdoor passion, the outdoor pursuits, you never stop learning. I can still see something on YouTube with one of these bushcraft guys and go, oh, actually that is a very cool idea. I never thought of doing it that way. Turn the wood that way. Okay, that's pretty cool. So that's one of the beautiful things. And Wild Harvest is big, big for me in that. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah, 18th Oshawa. Uh, I understand that you're now our ambassador for Scouts Canada. And it, this is a little bit off topic for everybody else. No, it's okay. Um, are you planning on doing... Just me and you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> are you planning on doing anything um, that would be really... Um, uplifting for the kids to learn about survival techniques with Scouts Canada? With Scouts, so uh, for those of you who might not be aware, uh, I was uh, asked to be Canada's Chief Scout last year. Yep. Uh, yeah, and thank you. And that was by far a huge honor. Um, actually, I was, it wasn't last year, it was, it was basically on the cusp of the pandemic. Yep. And so that, when we hit this kind of wall, right? I was there that day that you had to White Pine, uh, White Pine Council. Yes, yes, White Pine, yes. So, uh, so yes, is the short answer is what I'm trying to work with scouts all the time that way. It's a slow moving beast, and it's a, and it's a difficult uh, bureaucratic schedule that way. But they're wonderful people, and it's always you know you remember everybody's volunteering. So trying, it's always it's hurting cats when you're trying to bring volunteers and you know onto the same Zoom meeting at the same time. And the last meeting we had, I was the one who blew it. I was the one who missed the meeting. So uh, that's like with the wild wild outside book, and even wild harvest. The cool thing about Survivor Man, it may have been for adults, but kids dressed up as Survivor Man for Halloween. <laughs> so, you know, uh, so it was always vital. In them. So when we came to do the Wild Outside book, and they were asking why, and I said, listen, understand this, that, yeah, it was an adult show, but not really. And, and I, you know, I don't even have to change anything. I don't even have to make it PG. Everything I do was, was already there. And anyway, kids, a lady asked me one time, how can she encourage her three-year-old daughter to, uh, to be, you know, get in, you know, be more involved with nature and that sort of thing. And I said, well, do you have a backyard? She happened to have a backyard. Okay. The grass? Yeah, it's grass. A couple of bushes? Yeah. When you have your daughter out there in the backyard, let her, let her get her hands dirty. Let her sit on the grass and get wet. Let her, let her pull up a worm after it's rained and it breaks off halfway and she comes in crying. Let that happen. And I think the concept of having your kids out in nature early, that's indelibly imprinted on them. Like, we all remember this. I mean, even when we're, you know, 55 and 65 and 45, we remember moments from the cottage, getting go, going in amongst the, the pickle weed, seeing cats and frogs. We never forget that. Even if we're accountants living in downtown New York City, we still, I'll hear people say, oh yeah, man, I miss, uh, I miss this or I miss that. And it's funny, we do come back to it. Eventually people come back to it. They get married, they have their kids, and, and all of a sudden they're 53 years old going, like me, I went for quite a few years without doing a canoe trip because of Survivor Man. And then finally, a few years back, I got back into canoeing again. And it was just like putting on that old comfortable hat. In fact, I still have that old comfortable hat. <laughs> yes, sir. The first thing you said is that you're a group head. So what's a recommended group? Oh, a recommended canoe route? First of all, all of Tomogamy. Yeah, Tomogamy is my homeland. Yeah, all of Tomogamy forwards. I've paddled all those rivers forwards and backwards. Killarney, Algonquin, you know. Uh, you know, pick the off times, the off seasons. You know, get go go in September. You know, <laughs> September's the best ever for canoeing out there because nobody's out there. Uh, and even me saying that doesn't mean everybody in this room is all of a sudden going to go on a canoe trip this September. But trust me, <laughs> if you do, it's the best time of year. And even October, 
Um, so tomography, and then of course, the grand epic trips are still grand and epic, like the Nahani River. You know, I mean, that's just every corner, every turn around the river, and you're like, oh, you see, you know, is it better than the one you just turned around? It's, it's really breathtaking. So Nahani is a life, that's a bucket list one, for sure, for people. Um, and uh, Northern Quebec, the Des Moines River. You know, I did a lot of black feather trips down the Des Moines River teaching my water canoeing. Yeah, so those are, but, but if you only have the time for a little bit, and it's, you don't want to go too far, Tomogamy. Tomogamy is like, I love Algonquin Park, don't get me wrong, but Tomogamy is Algonquin without the people. <laughs> <laughs> Way in the back, gray shirt, yeah. Uh, in a winter survival situation, what happens if you sweat? Uh, I don't know, you tell me. You die. If you sweat, you, you die. die. Why, though? Why is that? This is my catchphrase. Uh, I, should, I think I patented it. To the trademark? I think a trademark. Uh, the whole thing about that, by the way, is this is me being, so, yeah, this is me nerding out. No matter how cool I think I am, you bring up survival stuff, I start nerding out. We go on snowshoeing somewhere together, I'll be like, stop going, hey, if you had to survive right now, where do you think you would do it? And I'm just gonna, I become this nerd. And so, uh, you sweat, you die. The nerdism behind that is the reality of it. And I discovered that very quickly, especially in winter camping. You're working hard, it's 2 p.m., you let yourself get all sweaty, your clothing gets sweaty. Why? Because you didn't lay her down. Okay, so now you're all sweaty. That's fine. Until it becomes 4.30 p.m. And in a, in a survival situation, now you're still sweaty. And that sweat becomes very cold and it, it, will, it can trigger, you know, you can become hypothermic. So, huge fan in winter camping is like, lay her down, lay her up, layer. Like, typical Canadian, I'm wearing long johns right now. That's why I'm sweating right now. It's like, well, yeah, I know, but I... I can't not wear long johns in the wintertime, even when I'm in Toronto. Uh, so, I'm, see, I'm nerding out. You got me nerding. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> so, you've been uh, in some of the most pristine dark skies. Um, have you ever dove into, this is kind of, I'm an astronomer, um, the astronomy side of things, and what is your favorite thing to look at in, like, these, like, non-light polluted skies? Mostly the Seven Sisters, Pleiades. Yeah, I like that because it's got that optical illusion thing. Yeah. yeah the, the Seven Sisters were up, question about astrology. Um, uh, sorry, <laughs> I'm a Libra, and uh, as such, coolest sign ever, uh, astronomy, same thing. So, uh, 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 I mean, that, you know, no, let's not go to, to the dark side too much, but it's one of the saddest things is when you can't get to dark skies, and, you know, I mean, yeah. Gosh, I wish there were more rules that way that, you know, things could become darker. It's, um, dark it stars. changes everything. If you see someone who's seen a, the stars, I've, I've seen 40-year-olds see the stars for the first time. Yeah. That shouldn't even happen. And what do they do? This. <laughs> they can't believe what they're seeing. Um, but uh, I'm still, I don't know. I mean, you know, Orion's always there for you. It's just so easy. Yeah. So yeah. I still, but, but the, I, I always point out the Seven Sisters. That's my favorite one to point out. But the Seven Sisters of Pleiades, if you try, if you look right at them, you can't see them. If you kind of fake them out, like, I'm not looking at you, <laughs> then you can see them. It's the weirdest thing, but your yeah. eye, you can't, look, they're gone. So try it. Uh, yes, sir. So the chance encounter with the lakes, was it Well, hang on. You just asked, the second part of the question was, did I really? <laughs> Is there any part of me through my entire career where you th guys thought you're not getting the real me? Yeah. Ever. And anybody who knows me knows they're just gonna get, so there's never, there's, you don't get embellishment with me. That's one of the reasons the networks had a tough time with me. I was not willing to embellish and create drama. Because what, seven days in the jungle in the Amazon with nothing isn't dramatic enough? So we find the next story. <laughs> You, that was exact. That was the story as it happened. Yes, I actually. It was tomography. It was the jogging trail between the North Town site and the main town in the back of the school. Sorry, at Northland Paradise, North Paradise Lodge. And when you uh, and I got and it, so here's the story. I saw this thing coming up through the reeds. Thought it was a black bear. It jumped up in front of me on the trail. It was a lynx. Wow. Beautiful little lynx. And I stood there, and I was like still. Because I knew this was going to be cool. Even if it was a black bear, it was going to be cool. And I stood there, and the lynx 
looked up at me and started to walk towards me, had the little kitty nose, doing the little kitty nose thing, and looked at me, and then it started to turn away. This story is in that wild outside book, by the way. And then it started to turn away. So I thought, well, what have I got to lose? <laughs> so I went, being a cat lover and a dog lover, I went, <laughs> and the lynx turned around, came back, sniffed my fingers, and then turned and walked away. Yes. Best animal encounter I've ever had. Chased up a tree by a moose, chased out of the jungle by the jaguar, uh, so many other instances, but that lynx moment, that's going with me to the grave, that one, because that was powerful and beautiful. Wow. Yes? Is there a specific trip or event that you point to that inspired you to do Survivor Man? Is there a specific event that inspired me to do Survivor Man. Yeah, it's a little, it's not as exciting as you might want to hear. Um, okay. And there's, there's a bunch of questions in there about like the industry and the shows that came along after and all that stuff. And, and the claim that Fred put up here, uh, you know, starting the industry and all that. We can get into that. But that's like an hour and a half talk in itself. But I was sitting in a classroom with Dave Arama, Doug Getgood, Fred Rowe, uh, Gino Safari wasn't there, but survival in the bush, learning at Humber College, that's where I started. Real simple, and sitting in a class, we're watching uh, an NFB film on a guy who went out and survived overnight. And uh, it looked pretty cheesy, it was cheesy. It was the 70s, shot in the 70s, NFB, it was pretty cheesy. Um, but watching that, what occurred to me was, of everything that was available at the time, which would be like home VHS tapes, way back. Uh, and even up until Survivor Man, you could see some survival programming where people were teaching you stuff. Uh, Rain Gears in Britain, who I was not aware of at all, but I was aware of Bush Tucker Man, for example. So these are skills that you taught. And the inspiration, what hit me there, that day in 1986, watching that film, was wouldn't it be so much cooler to show the fireboat, but in a situation where you really needed the fireboat? That would be teaching the fireboat. And I stored that idea in my brain for 13 years before I pitched it to Discover Canada. And, uh, and the rest is history, as they say. So it was that moment in that class, I think. Yeah. Uh, what was your most humbling experience in nature? Well, most humbling experience in nature? In Norway. In Norway, yeah. The, the walk down the mountainside in Norway. And here's a thing that happens, and it happens certainly in nature, and definitely in your outdoor adventures. There's two ways to say this next line. You can say, uh, okay, listen, I got this. That's a really nice, confident way of saying, okay, well, I'll, I'll take command here. The other way is to go, I got this. I mean, what could go wrong? I'm Survivor Man, I got it. That's the way I thought when I went into to Norway. And I had to go down that mountainside, so I was in the car, spying in the car, Went up a bit further, up the mountains a bit, found a little cabin, stayed overnight in that, came down, now I'm gonna go down in the fjord. Uh, blizzard up top, freezing rain all the way down, six feet of snow down to green. And I just thought I'll just go down the mountain because I was cocky and overconfident. And I thought, well, I'm Survivor Man, I got this, no problem. And that was hell, it was absolute hell. Um, my legs gave out, uh, I ended up going down on my bum. And if you think going down a hill on your bum is fun, it is for 30 feet. <laughs> this was two miles. Wow. Two miles on my bum. And it ripping and all that. And um, it was absolute agony. I was soaked to the skin uh, with both sweat and freezing rain. And I really did fear for my life in that. If you watch the Norway episode, it's on YouTube. That second half of the Norway episode, I absolutely there's things that Barry Farrell, the editor, didn't didn't the editor didn't put in the show because it was like okay that's because I was you know I when I'm in those situations I talk to myself come on Les what are you doing you know I do I'm talking to myself and uh, using other words and had to, we just kept that out but you could you could still hear the intensity in my voice I was all I was worried I was really worried uh, down in the hillside in Romania was. Only half that bad. Same sort of situation, but you know, there I kept worrying because I was going down steep. Like, what if I kick over like a hornet's nest? You know, that's my biggest concern over all the years of Survivor Man. What if I kick over a hornet's nest? I never did, but I always thought if I ever like bump into a hornet's nest, um, I got nowhere to run. There's no tent I can jump into. Um, that was always one of my biggest worries. Next, yes.
Am I planning on featuring other people on Wild Harvest that? Oh, yes, and, and we already did. We already did. On some of the episodes, we've got uh, Vanessa from Belize, we've got um, Chef from The Aggressor, we've got Fiona from the West Coast. I could go on. There's about a half, and, and, but we'd like to do more and more all the time. Oh, I know Pascal, yeah. Yeah, Pascal's brilliant. Yeah, yeah. No, I haven't, I haven't met him, uh, but I think we talked. I think we talked on the phone at one point. Um, and his work is brilliant. This is all local foraging stuff. So Pascal Vidar out of California does beautiful, beautiful uh, work in local foraging. And he, he's, he doesn't think or remember about Survivor Man and me, local, for, local foraging and me. Is I don't take myself all that seriously. So, when, when you watch Survivor Man, and if I see like some of the criticisms and so on, it's because they miss that I'm doing it with a twinkle in my eye and a bit of a wry smile. It's like, come on, it's, you know, I take survival seriously, I take skill sets seriously, I take teaching about and sharing nature very seriously. I don't take myself that seriously, which is why I can laugh at myself in these varying situations, which sometimes put other people's noses out of joint if they were like deeply into survival. Same thing with the local foraging. I've seen some, some people think it, and then you see the poster and you're all freaked out. It's like, dude, chillax. You know, I was just showing a dandelion. It's, I got everything right. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> well, let's see. Survivor Man merch. Well, now you're leading me off on another tangent. Hence, on my last thing that I just said about not taking myself too seriously, why do you think I've not been, you know, what do they call it? When you're selling stuff all the time, schlocking gear. And you don't see a ton of Survivor Man merchandise and Scooby Doo underwear merchandise because. I just can't, I couldn't bring myself to become that marketing guy where it's all about the widgets and stuff. I didn't, I stopped making the Camillus knives uh, because they wanted to just do everything on the cheap and just pump it out, pump it out, get it in Walmart. So that ain't me. So yes and no. Uh, but the stuff that I do have, uh, like the Hella knives and the new LT Wright knife collection, the, the, the local forging stuff, you can bet I put my heart and soul into making sure, as I always say, holding their feet to the fire to get great, great product. You know? I already asked you. Yes, sir. Uh, what? Bless you. <laughs> what episode of Survivor Man were you most excited to shoot and actually turned out great? Which episode of Survivor Man was I the most excited to shoot and also turned out great? Arctic. Arctic. The cool thing about the Arctic episode was, uh, so, in Survivor Man, there is a crew, not with me. They're five to 50 kilometers away. Why are they there? Legality for one thing, uh, and then the other thing, <laughs> I told so many lies to the networks. Yeah, I've got a paramedic. And, well, he has to be with you all the time. Sure, fine. Have you seen the show? <laughs> anyway, so they're so Max and the, the crew, they're, they're like five miles away or something like that um, in the Arctic. And their guide, a wonderful, amazing guide, but not the, I'd say this to his face, the brilliant guy, guy, but not the best when it came to food. So they're sitting there five miles away eating chicken noodle soup every day, heating a tent with a, with a propane stove, getting asphyxiated by that, and the wind's blowing them over, they're freezing, and in the Arctic, eventually, I caught four massive Arctic char, had a big roaring fire, and sat there and ate, you know, amazing sushi for the rest of the So the Arctic, to me, that's one of my favorite, as far as being really super happy, Excited for it, and then really happy how it turned it out. Turned out, I'd say that's probably way up to the top of the list. Unlike unlike Argentina, which was a which was a disaster. Yes, sir. After falling down the hill for two miles, yeah. Keeps me motivated, sort of thing. And that was one of the questions on Instagram too. Um, in a different way though. Uh, so to get a little more deeper about it, I would think about this little girl right here. And I would think that somewhere, at some point, at some time, after the editing's done, and it's delivered to the networks, and it's up on there, and some, this little girl's gonna be at home, watching me do this thing. So all I have to look at is this round, black circle in front of me, my camera. Right? 
And I would, if I didn't, so I'm like, I just want to go home. Uh, I just want to go have a pizza and get out of here. I would think of this little girl and, and maybe that little boy. And I would think somewhere out there is going to be a five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven year old girl or boy, and they're hanging off every word I'm saying right now. So suck it up, buttercup. Let's go. <sighs> do this properly. You're teaching how to do this gun and steal thing? Teach it. Film it well. Get everything you can. Teach, teach, teach. So that was, you know, was my motivation. I think more than anything else, that's what it always came back to. If I got lazy, I just thought, you know, I got a, I got a crayon drawn picture sent to me in the mail of someone who loves Survivor Man, and a picture of them dressed up as me for Halloween. That's who I'm doing it for. And everything else, you know, everything else up above that can be damned. That was the most important thing. So, uh, it's okay. Biggest struggle while filming yourself, and I've never lost all the footage, filming is a heck of a struggle. Um, I've lost tons of footage. And how do you, how do you, so, a tangent a little. There's a dude right now who's got a Survivor Man is fake and I can prove it. And uh, so, oh, have at her. And uh, <laughs> it's, it's really silly because he'll pick a scene and go, yeah, that's just too convenient. That's his, that's his proof. That's just too convenient. He found a lighter in Grenada on the shore. That's too convenient. He must be lying. But my point is, he didn't understand, also didn't understand filmmaking at all, because he was picking across a part by filmmaking. You gotta understand, I challenge any one of you, go out and just try to film yourself. How about try to film yourself in the kitchen making some scrambled eggs with three cameras? Just try it. See how much you like it. <laughs> it is really difficult to film yourself Angles, cameras drop. This one, the, the card, you're like, you're, you're, you're like, okay. Here, now you'll know, now you know I'm just an actor. All right, so it's been about day five now. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm just gonna have to do this fire one. This is the last of my tinder. Now try doing that, and then you hear, beep, 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 <laughs> beep. Like, card stop. Okay, fix Fresh card, okay. Record, record, record. <laughs> okay, it's been five days. I'm gonna figure out this expired dog. And, and I look up, and, and it's like, and then, oh, battery dead. Ah, now the battery's dead on this one, right? And then I look over, this one was in the mud, and now it's doing this. <laughs> All the time, almost every scene. I mean, I'm sure I got good at it. But man, filming yourself out in a survival situation, now remember, it's the fourth day. What have I eaten so far? Two snails and a worm. <laughs> so what is that challenge to do when you're filming survival? Lethargy. That was the biggest challenge with lack of food. It's not the hunger pains, and I can squelch that a lot, by the way, if you can guzzle a lot of water, which I would do if I was by the lake. Right? It's not the hunger pains, it's the lethargy. Because after three days, four days without food, remember you gotta film yourself, you gotta put up all four cameras, put one up on that ledge up there, gotta do all that. But what happens is, you sit down, you're gonna take a 20 minute break. When you get up, three hours has passed, and it feels like five minutes gone by. So that's another challenge, is just the lethargy of filming yourself. But those batteries, those cards, the dirty lens, the camera that falls over, the one that gets the moisture meter comes up and says it's gonna stop shooting. <laughs> that guy said, he said, he didn't believe me that all my cameras succumbed to moisture in the jungle. It was the jungle in poor rain every single day. What did you think was gonna, you know, and yeah, I was down to one camera after like the second day in the Amazon jungle. The other three cameras, moisture, moisture, moisture. If anybody, have you ever had a camera shut down for moisture, you know what I'm talking about. Happens to pro cameras too. So that was a big challenge. Um, and as far as losing footage, yeah. There's been times I go, oh, I'd say to my editor, Barry, where do you see what I, day three? I got this rabbit and I did this thing. And, and we, go, you know, we could go by and he'd be like, yeah, Les, we couldn't find that footage. I'm like, no, 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 it's gotta be there. And we couldn't find it. Which tape? Let's tape A6. And, uh, it's not there. And so, yeah, I lost, I lost lots of footage lots of times. So what you saw, so what you saw was so rugged and raw. I didn't have a camera crew getting all these beautiful angles and stuff like that. 
So, you know, and one of the beautiful things creatively I loved about making that series was the mother of invention. Uh, what's that phrase? Necessity is the mother of invention. Yeah. So with Survivor Man, understand why there's the braggadocio claim of being the only guy to ever entirely do, you know, produce, write, shoot everything, an international series is because if you think about it, when you look at the show, I, I was, I had to shoot it in certain, in, in only certain ways because I only had me and four cameras. And that makes you do things. And the beautiful part of that was I would see shows imitating that later. I'm like, you have a camera crew. You don't even have to do that. You know, you see, here's what you see. You see like Bear Grylls holding his cameraman's camera guy. Oh, right, now I'm going into the jungle now. And he's <laughs> pretending to film himself while holding somebody's big Sony digi, digi beta camera. It was ridiculous. So it was incredibly, that, that's, um, it's a great question and one that is, is underestimated. And I have had the odd, wonderful person say, dude, I'm trying to do what you did with one camera. I couldn't do it. I was like, I said, yeah, uh-huh, you know, yes sir. What's your favorite uh, Survivor Man and Sun episode? Favorite Survivor Man and Sun episode? Well, I'll tell you a little, not, not that it's a dark story, but a little thing that I didn't know. Is some, I've seen some people, oh, 20 minutes, two hours? I have two hours left, great. I gotta close out. Um, and in the Tofino episode, uh, and you see kind of like, come on, Logan, like, dude, he had cancer, and we didn't know that at the time. So he was suffering from leukemia and had no energy. He's fine now, he's actually a paramedic on the West Coast and a smoke jumper. Um, so, uh, that, but that Tofino episode is sort of bittersweet. You know, it was his 16th birthday on the episode, but there was that issue in the background we knew nothing about. Uh, but I still think the Tofino episode. I want to do a, I want to do a question here. You still filming? Yeah, you're still filming. Good, good, good. Because this is important. So two questions, and then Fred's going to kick me off the stage. But I'm not leaving. I will go and meet you at the Survivor Man VR booth right after this. Because if we stay here, it's going to be all night. Uh, quick question from filming. Good, because I want to have this later. This is for uh, someone who uh, has been with me right from the beginning in many ways. Uh, I can tell her her handle is Perseverance1501. Any ideas if I did another Survivor Man, which locations would I like to consider? The answer to that will always be where I didn't get make it to, which is the Himalayan Mountains. I never did a show in the Himalayan Mountains. I did it in the foothills in India, but I wanted to get right into Tibet, and that would be the place I would go. And the second question is for my friends who are here today, Algonquin Outfitters. Amazing, amazing shot. Which piece of outdoor gear has lasted me the longest and perhaps is a favorite that I still use today? Even though I designed the beautiful Hella knives, the, uh, the Tomogamy, I called it the Tomogamy, and I have a Wabakimi knife as well with Hella, gorgeous, and the new knives with LT Wright for the Wild Harvest series, also beautiful knives. I gotta say, two things on this. First one is my favorite knife that I had lasted for long was the simple Buck one. Buck 119. Buck 119. I love that knife. I've always loved that knife, except you gotta grind off the tip because it's too pointy. You always snap that tip when you're doing something. Let's see, you grind off that tip, it's a beautiful, perfect knife. And all of my canoeing years were spent with the Buck 119. And then the second part thing is, is I'm gonna, here's a tangent answer that you aren't asking, I'm gonna give you. The whole thing about the belt knife, can we get past it being the coolest survival tool ever? It is not. If you want to send me out with only one item, it's going to be something to light a fire. I don't want a knife. Second item, a tarp or a bug net. I don't need the knife. I can make a knife out there. It's so cool when we have our cool belt knives, but they, they are not the number one survival item. They are not at all. It's always about the variables. Start with your fire starting, then move to the temperature and the weather that you're going to be in. And usually a tarp is a big thing, because unless you're in the desert, it's going to rain. Fred's going to kick me off the stage right now. I'm going to go right over to the Smire Man VR booth, right, I'm going to be like Elvis, and I'm going to go like right through the crowd. And I'm going to meet you over at the Smire Man VR booth. Thank you guys, I wish I had two hours.